Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. This podcast is brought to you by Jarhead Diagnostics. Jarhead Diagnostics manufactures in-house diagnostic equipment and storage solutions, as well as distributes for companies like Pico, ATS, and Topdon. One of my favorite tools that I have bought from Brandon and Jarhead Diag is the case for the U-Scope. If you don't have a U-Scope, you probably should, but if you have one, you got to get one of these 3D printed cases, has a magnet on it, has a full-size BNC lead that you can connect to, and it gets rid of the weak point of that scope, which is the mini BNC connection, which is pretty fragile. This case makes this thing nice and secure and makes it an even better tool than it was. So check out jarheaddiag.com. The link is in the show This notes. episode is brought to you by L1 Automotive Training and Keith Perkins. If you're looking for education on module programming, J2534, EEPROM work, key and immobilizer, electrical diagnostics, or drivability diagnostics, Keith has a website, l1training.com, that's got over 60 hours of training videos on all those subjects and more. When I first started out doing mobile, I utilized Keith's videos on module programming and J2534 in order to get my head wrapped around what I would need for the tooling, the computers, the software setups, you know, what kind of obstacles I would be up against when I'm out there programming modules on cars. And it was a huge benefit to me. And I continue to use the training videos um, that he has on his website. So I strongly recommend checking out l1training.com. The link is in the show notes. Hey, what's going on, automotive world? Welcome to another episode of the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Tipping. I'll be your host once again for this week's episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Today on the show, I've got another interesting case study for you on a vehicle that I recently diagnosed at a shop. This was a 2014 Acura RLX. It's a Kind of a high level sedan that they offer. I don't see too many of this exact model, but uh, I do see a fair amount of uh, Honda Acura vehicles. Anyways, this one had an immobilizer fault, at least that's what the shop was assuming, and they ended up being correct in the fact that the problem was within the immobilizer system. Uh, but this was a start stall situation, right? So you hit the push button. It is a push button smart key system with your foot on the brake and it keys up and the engine cranks. It starts, but then it immediately stalls and uh, the key light, the little green key light is flashing on the dash. So that's what I'm up against on that. But before we get into the actual episode here, I want to announce our first winner of a free t-shirt. Uh, we're going to be doing this monthly on the podcast. And all you have to do to enter to win is leave a comment on our YouTube channel or a review on the podcast through Apple Podcasts. That's it. And your name will be entered to win, and we will do a random drawing at the end of every month and announce the winner on the podcast, which I'm about to do for December 2023. So our winner for this month is Groucho the Man. Uh, that's the username. He left a review on the podcast on December 11th. So Groucho, if you are listening to the podcast, shoot me a message through Facebook Messenger or through the email that you'll find in the show notes. Uh, send your address and t-shirt size and we will get that sent out to you. If you want to be entered for future dr drawings for the winner of a t-shirt, all you got to do, leave a comment on that YouTube channel that we've got. And just as a reminder, we do have a YouTube channel. I have a PowerPoint overlay of all the case studies and for future interviews, 
that we do with guests, we'll have a recorded version of that with video. Now, again, my goal is to keep this podcast so you could listen to it audio only and get everything you need out of it. But there's a little bit of an extra element to uh, the visual portion that we'll have on YouTube for the case studies. There's some pictures and stuff like that um, just to add to uh, what we're offering with the podcast. But anyways, with that out of the way, congratulations, Groucho. Let's get into the episode here. So um, again, the first thing that we've got here is uh, the customer concern. And again, this is that the vehicle starts and stalls and that our green key light is going to flash on the dash and Honda Acura has this little green symbol of a key on a dash for uh, many, many, many years. This has been their immobilizer indicator on most vehicles that I can remember um, going all the way back to the late nineties. So you'll see this in a lot of Honda and Acura vehicles. And if it's flashing, that usually means that there is some sort of immobilizer issue. And that's what we have here along with the start stall which not always, but a lot, the start and stall function of an engine is a good indicator that you have some sort of a mobilizer issue. It's allowing the vehicle to start at first, but it's not getting the fuel release password from whatever modules are involved. And we'll figure that out on this one. And so it's shutting down the injectors. So uh, first thing that I want to do is verify the concern, of course. And luckily, this is a hard fault this thing will not start and run. Uh, it is broken right now all the time. I like those kinds of faults. It makes things a lot easier to figure out what's going on. Now, this one wasn't the easiest one in the world to solve, but at least it's broken all the time. And that uh, makes testing a little bit easier to figure out what's going on. Uh, first thing I do on something like this after verifying the concern is a full vehicle scan. I do that in just about every car that I touch. Uh, but especially something like this is I want to get a full picture of what's going on with the vehicle. Um, there's a number of codes in the car. There's a lot of modules on this thing, but the only uh, modules that have codes in them are the airbag, which it looked like the airbag must have been deployed at some point or another, and they didn't repair all the components. There's some circuit codes in there. Um, and then there's also ABS codes. Now, I was, I was wondering a little bit about the airbag stuff. Does that have anything to do with maybe a fuel supply or something? But I didn't see any codes in there that really indicated to me that this had something to do with the immobilizer, especially being that the immobilizer light is flashing. Now, I don't have any codes in what I can see in my initial scan related to an immobilizer module. Those are all everything that I see, and I'll get into the details of what I do see, but there's no codes there. It's just a ABS code, I think for a wheel speed sensor and then uh, airbag codes for some of the circuit issues. So again, uh, I don't see anything on this initial scan that points me in the direction of, oh, okay, I need to chase this. Um, I'm also pretty unfamiliar with this particular push button start system on this Acura. You know, I've, I've done a lot of key work with Hondas and Acuras, but not a ton of diagnostic work especially when it comes to the smart key portion. Some of the old bladed immobilizer systems I've dove into on Honda Acura stuff uh, where it has an immobilizer module that's up at the ignition. Uh, it's going to read the key. And I, I've done a few things with that, but not a whole lot with the push button start. And, you know, I found in general the push button start systems on any vehicle can be a bit complex if you're not familiar with them and you don't know what modules are involved. You don't even really know exactly how the system works, right? I mean, the nice part is a lot of smart key systems have similar functions or the, the idea behind them is going to be very similar, but the modules involved and how everything works together can vary quite a bit from brand to brand or vehicle to vehicle. And where I'm going with this is with this particular one, if I'm just sitting there in the driver's seat doing the scan, I don't even know for sure what modules are involved or how this system works. So the question is, of course, where do I start? Um, and I'm going to read some service information, but I do like to account for everything that I can observe up front with my just initial inspection, right? I'm verifying the concern. I'm observing things in the vehicle and I've 
scanned it with a scan tool, what do I see? What is really obvious and stands out? What can I say for sure? And what do I need to figure out? Right. So here's the first thing that I is very clear and obvious. The vehicle does actually key up when I'm in the vehicle with the smart key and I press the button on the dash. The ignition turns on and it actually cranks over and starts. And so again, even though I'm not super familiar with this system, what I can probably say is that the key, actually I had two keys for this. A customer brought two of them in. I think the I think the my customer, the shop, requested their customer bring a second key because they were suspicious it might be a key issue since they had identified it was an immobilizer problem. But uh, didn't fix it. Tried both keys, you know, one in, one out of the car. Same thing with both of them. But here's the other thing is with most smart key systems, I can't say this is true 100% across the board. I'm sure there's an exception. But in my experience, for most smart key systems, if there is a key issue, whether it be with the key or the antennas in the vehicle, something with that, the dash, the ignition, it's not going to key up when you hit that button. It's going to give you some warning on the dash, say, hey, smart key is not detected or smart key not present or hold key up to ignition or something like that. You'll get a message like that if there's a key issue. So even without diving into the system and really knowing the system, and of course I got to read, but I can probably say that the key is not our issue and that's not the immobilizer fault that we're dealing with. But I don't, again, I don't fully understand the system and how everything works together. So I can't be 100% confident in that, but I do notice that, hey, this thing keys up with the vehicle or um, with the key. And so the key appears to be okay, or both of them appear to be okay. Um, now, the engine does start and stall, but I don't have any immobilizer or communication codes that popped up on my scan, which seems odd. I feel like if this thing's in an immobilized state, shouldn't it give me some sort of trouble code somewhere indicating where I need to go? But I don't see anything uh, with my top down that I scan this with. Okay, but that's just that's an observation at this point that I'm going to keep in mind. Um, I did notice on my uh, full vehicle scan, and the top down gives you a nice topology breakdown of the vehicle, that there's an immobilizer module, but it's grayed out. And I did see a one push start module that did scan and came up with no codes. And this is just looking at the topology screen. I haven't gone into these modules yet, but I'm just looking to see, hey, is there an immobilizer module? And it it shows it, but it's grayed out. And I don't know what that means right off the bat because what top down and a lot of aftermarket tools will do is they'll scan all of the potential modules for a vehicle. And if something is either a no com or not equipped, it's just going to gray it out. And so some of the time the challenge is on us as technicians to say, is this supposed to be present and communicating or is the fact that it's grayed out just mean that it's not equipped and Honda's and Acura's specifically, and this isn't just top down. This is, any aftermarket tool, the tools seem to go through every module that could have ever been possible on a Honda and give you a full list. So some of these scans take a long time because it's looking for 20 modules that don't even exist on this vehicle. Weren't even an option on this particular vehicle, but they were option on some Honda at some point. And so you get a really long list of modules that are grayed out on a lot of these vehicles. And you want to be aware of that. And again, I'm my focus is narrowed in on the immobilizer system. Right? There's lots of modules grayed out, but I see that immobilizer module grayed out. Okay. But I do also see a one push start that's green, no code. So, so what does that mean? I don't know yet. Just something that I've observed before I dive in to the reading and the actual operation of this system. So now that I've got that, that's exactly what it's time for is some reading. And I want to know how this immobilizer system works and what modules are actually involved on this particular Acura. And that's going to give me some more direction on where to go and what to start for testing. Um, I will say service information on this is really helpful. Um, and they give you a really good breakdown in the description operations section for the immobilizer. And it breaks it down 
into different functions of the immobilizer system, which is, again, really nice because I can kind of divide up the different operations and the different things that need to happen in order for the vehicle to key up, to start, and continue running. So I got to figure out where within these functions and which modules are involved, where, where I am, right? What part of the immobilizer process or the functions within this immobilizer smart key system, where am I, where's my fault, why? And then again, what modules are involved? And I'm gonna go through all the different functions of this immobilizer system because sometimes it's really helpful to do that just so you can understand what the problem isn't, right? I'm not really sure which way to go right at this moment because I don't know the system. But if I review each step, each function, the way this thing works, it's going to be a lot easier for me to say, okay, well, it's definitely not this. And I've kind of already done that with the key. I'll, I'll go back over the key a little bit. I can kind of say that, hey, this key probably is not the issue, but I'm going to read up and make sure of that. So then I can go forward and look at other components. So let's do that. Let's kind of break this down um, for this uh, smart key system. They call it a keyless access system. And really everything is going to center around our keyless access control unit or smart key unit, some you know, manufacturers would call this, but Acura's name for this in-service information is keyless access control unit. Now I'll get to this a little bit later, but the names of the modules are very confusing when it goes between service information and scan tool. And I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. So just keep in mind what I'm going to read to you first or explain to you first is out of service information and the names that they give the modules there. And then we'll talk about what we see in the scan tool a little later, because honestly it was rather confusing to figure out what was what, because the names changed between service information and the scan tool. And that's, this is not just a one-time thing. This seems to happen a lot in vehicles where things don't line up between service info and scan tool. But anyways, the keyless access control unit is kind of the center of all of this as far as the smart key functions and really the immobilizer function of the vehicle as well. And we got a number of components that are gonna be connected to the keyless access control unit uh, for various functions. There's a low frequency antennas that are gonna be connected throughout the vehicle. There's a RF receiver, there's a steering lock, there's the start button up on the dashboard, the ignition start button. There's the MICU or MCIU, which is kind of like the body control module. It's the fuse box under the dash and the powertrain control module. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff. I just listed a bunch, but I'm going to break it down into different sections here. But all of those modules tie in somewhere with the smart key function slash immobilizer function. And we can get out of the way right now that those are actually two different things. There's a smart key operation, which allows you to key up the vehicle powered up, but then there's an immobilizer portion, which is actually separate from the key. And if you can't key it up, you can't even get to the immobilizer function. But in my case, you're going to key it up. And then it also has to pass this immobilizer function in order for the engine to run. Okay. So the physical location of these components, just so that you can have an idea in your head. And this actually took me a little bit too of digging through service information because I didn't know where any of this stuff was. PCM left or right front under the hood. The MCIU is going to be under the left side of the dash. It's the fuse box. The keyless entry control unit is also under the left side of the dash. It's actually right above the, the fuse box there. They're in very close proximity to each other. And then the RF receiver is going to be in the rear of the passenger compartment above the trunk area. And then there's low frequency antennas that are going to be throughout the vehicle in various locations, handles inside the vehicle. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, but there's multiple low frequency, low frequency antennas because they have a short range and are made to detect the key within the vehicle, right? If you hold the key outside of the door, uh, those antennas can't pick it up anymore. So they have a very small range in which they read. 
So for the keyless entry function, uh, right, and again, I'm just going to break these down because I've kind of already made these checks in my mind, but I'm going through the functions in service info and just saying, yep, okay, that works. This is when you're walking up to the vehicle, you hit the remote on the button, it emits a 315 megahertz signal. The RF receiver, which is in the vehicle, picks up that signal, relays that info to the keyless access control unit, and then the keyless access control unit says, yep, this is the key that belongs to this vehicle, sends a signal to the fuse box, the BCM, MCIU, to hey, unlock the doors, turn on the lights, so, uh, you know, sound the horn, whatever function that you, you press on that button, open the trunk, it's going to do that. And this works, right? And not that this would prevent me from starting the vehicle, but again, I'm going through each of the functions and I know that my key is able to lock, unlock all the RF functions work on the remote, okay? The next portion of the key is going to be the smart key function. And this is so when you hop in the vehicle, you got the key in your pocket, you press the ignition, does it key up? And we've established that that does. But when that happens and you press the start button, the start button, which is actually a small module in itself, I didn't realize this at first, but if you look at the diagram, it's got a control unit inside of the button on the dash. It's going to send a signal to our keyless access control unit, which then triggers the low frequency antennas in the vehicle. And this is like 125 kilohertz signal that these are going to send out within the vehicle to say, hey, is this key there? Then the key responds by sending a 315 megahertz signal back to the RF receiver, which then goes back to the keyless access control unit, says, oh, yep, the key is here. And then it tells the MCIU to power up the vehicle and, um, you know, ignition on, relays on, all of that stuff. Everything lights up on the dash. Uh, it also releases the steering lock at this point as well. And so all of this happens. And so I know all of this stuff is functional and good. So we're not going to spend a whole lot more time on that. Um, give everything there a good thumbs up and move on to our next portion of this immobilizer system. And this is where I, you know, I was trying to figure out where in this system am I at? What portion do I need to function on, focus on for functions? And this is it. So for the actual immobilizer portion of this system, once the vehicle actually is keyed up, the keyless entry unit, the MCIU, the P and the PCM are going to communicate the immobilizer code between those three modules, right? So keyless access, our body control module, essentially, and our powertrain control module. And they're connected on a network that is only between these three modules. It's called the S-Net. And if you've done stuff with Honda Acura before, you've seen the S-Net uh, referenced as far as mobilizer security stuff between modules. And it's a red wire that just goes between these three modules. Okay. Now, if these all agree with the immobilizer code, once you key up the vehicle, it'll allow the vehicle to start and run. But if not, it's going to do a start stall. And then the green key light is going to flash. Um, there's actually a different key light for a smart key fault I found in doing my research for this. But anyways, that green key light, that means that there is an immobilizer problem if it's flashing on the dash. And then the start stall is a pretty good indicator as well. So what I've kind of done here is gotten myself familiar with everything involved with the smart key system and the immobilizer, but now also zeroed in on what components are involved with the portion of the system that's not working. And that's where I'm at. Keyless access control, the MCIU, and then the PCM as well. So back to the car, you know, I feel as though um, I know what portion of this that's experiencing a problem and I know the components involved. So where do I start with my testing? Back to the scan that I did, the immobilizer module didn't show up on the scan, but I did see a one push start module that popped up on there. So maybe that's my keyless access control module. I, I don't know yet. Uh, one issue that I find pretty often, and I mentioned this before, was that the terminology used in the scan tool can often be different than what you find in service information. 
And this can be an aftermarket tooling thing, but it can be with the factory tooling as well, where for whatever reason, the people who created the service information and the people who created the scan tool interface maybe just weren't on the same page. And so they're named different things. And everywhere in service info, you find keyless access control unit listed for our keyless access control unit. But in the scan tool, you're going to find it as a one push start module. And that is actually referenced at a couple points in service information if you dig deep enough. But it's not clear in the scan tool that that's what that is. Now, you can probably infer by reading. But again, when I'm trying to, when I'm unfamiliar with the system and I'm trying to figure out what modules are involved, it, this made it really confusing to figure out what was what when I was just in this car trying to sort through everything. And I had to do a little bit of experimenting and messing around to figure out which module was which. And I'm going to summarize this here because if you work on one of these or something similar to this, you may see all these different names. And so I want you to know what each one is. Uh, so the first one, again, is the one push start. You'll see that as a module listed. Now on the top down here, there was also immobilizer. What I found was, even though the immobilizer portion was grayed out during testing, if you click on it, you can go in and it actually gets you to the same place as if you were to click on the one push start. So they're essentially the same thing. So this is the keyless access control unit. Um, but then even when you go in there, there's another name that they put in there. It's PCU. It's listed once you're in because the pressing either the immobilizer, the one push start gets you the same spot. But once you're in there, it breaks it down into other sub control modules. And one of them says PCU. One of them says backup control unit and one of them says uh, smart key something or another. But it, again, it gets really kind of disorienting because you're like, well, what module am I actually connected to? But all of that, all of that centers around our keyless access control unit. Now, it does list backup control unit in there. And as far as I could surmise, that is the button on the dash as our backup control unit, but we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, as far as our MCIU, and I think I've been uh, moving the letters around on that, it it actually is multiplex integrated control unit. So M-I-C-U is what I need to go with. So I apologize if I've been back and forth on the lettering there. M-I-C-U, multiplex integrated control unit. That is the fuse box or body control module that's under the left side of the dash. In the scan tool, it's listed as body electrical system on your initial scan. So you're not going to find MICU. You're not going to find BCM. You're going to find body electrical system. And you have to go into that if you want to communicate with this module. Let's add some more confusion to that. There are times within the tool that it's listed as the EMOS unit, which is Honda Immobilizer System. And I don't know why there's so many different names for the different components here, but this was a big stumbling block for me when I was at this car because I was wondering to myself, is there another module involved that I don't understand? Did I not read thoroughly through the service information? Um, is my aftermarket tooling providing me with some bad info? I wasn't sure, but what it really comes down to is the modules that I described and that's it. And even though there's some different names in the scan tool, it's really just that, you know, M I C U the PCM, which is that one's pretty clear. It's powertrain control module. There was no, um, anything disorienting about that part, part of it. No other names for that. Um, but our M I C U and our keyless access control unit, right? I'm really just down to those two, even though they have different names within the scan tool. So I don't mean to make it more confusing than it needs to be, but at the car, I was a little confused there and I wanted to point that out. So what I decided to do at this point, because I know the three modules, once I made that determination, I know the three modules involved with the immobilizer and I want to double check those to make sure there are no codes 
in them and to see maybe, hey, I can look at some useful data pads that are present in each one of these modules just to see. And there are no codes, double check that. Need, I, and I can talk to all three of these modules. That's the other thing is there's no communication codes in any of them saying, hey, I can't talk to this module. Plus I can talk to all three of these modules without issue. As far as data PIDs go, um, the one I did see that really just confirms what I already know is in the PCM, there's an immobilizer data PID and it just says BAN, B-A-N, and that's it and it never changes. And I guess that makes sense because it is banning the engine from running essentially, right? We key it up, it cranks, it starts, it stalls. Now, in the keyless access control unit, I didn't really find anything that useful. A lot of it had to do with the key itself. And again, I already know all that works and the key's in there and it's registered to the vehicle and that's all good. I didn't really see a whole lot else there that indicated an issue and I couldn't find anything in the MICU either that indicated an issue with the immobilizer system. Just that one in the PCM that said ban. Now, that's not saying there isn't a useful data PID, but I didn't see it with my initial inspection. Um, so I don't have a ton of direction there. So I'm gonna actually go back to service information here to see is there anything else that I can absorb from Honda Acura information on this system to get me in a direction. And literally, here's all I did. I use all data. I use Identifix too, and Identifix didn't have anything on this. But uh, not not that they didn't have the service info. They didn't have any archive hits for what I was looking for. But um, I like all data as far as the structure of their information, how they organize things. But also, their search function is pretty impressive too. Uh, I like the way... It, it's very intuitive, right? You search something, it's going to pull up stuff that's pretty relevant to your topic. And Identifix can definitely be that way too. And I'll bounce between the two of them. Sometimes I'll have them open on two different tabs so that I could have, um, you know, a connector pin out on one uh, one page, one tab, and then I could have a diagram on the other one and flip between or or something like that. Anyways, here's what I did on this one. I was I had all data open and I just typed immobilizer in the search bar on the top right of all data. And the very first thing that it popped up with was testing and inspection for the immobilizer system. And it reads out exactly like this. Engine starts, but stalls immediately. Parentheses, MIL works okay. No DTC set. Immobilizer indicator stays on or flashes. And that has a link that you can click on for that. And that's exactly what I have going on with this vehicle, right? So the engine starts and stalls and the, the light seems to work okay. There's no codes anywhere, which is the case for me. And the immobilizer light is flashing. So I'm like, oh, sweet, I'm clicking on this. This is my problem. And this is going to be hopefully really helpful to guide me towards the solution. And it was. The key here was service information. And I actually, you know, I'm summarizing all of this in hindsight after the fact. I dinked around with the car for quite a bit looking at things and trying to figure out, again, I was disoriented as far as what module was what and what actually existed on the car. And having that immobilizer uh, tab that brought me kind of the same section, that was confusing. I, I messed around for quite a while before going to this. So just keep in mind, this is a summarization of me being at the car, but this is the point where it actually opened my eyes to, oh, this is what I need to do and how I need to do it, okay? So I click on this link um, that's within all data and it's really, really helpful. It's because it's exactly what I have going on. So this breaks down a testing process for you. And the first thing it has you do is some general checks. And I've already done some of these, like look for codes and this and that, and you know make sure modules are online. Um, but it also has a list of fuses for you to check, specific fuses that relate to this system. I'm like, well, oh, I'm definitely doing that. So that's the first thing I do, grab my test light, and I go and I check the fuses, and I actually pull them out because you, know, you could have power on the top of a fuse, but maybe there's some corrosion. One of these is under the, or a couple of these were under the hood. So anyways, I do my check. Everything comes back good there. I don't see any problems with fuses. Doesn't mean the power of the modules is all good, but this is the checks it has you do. 
and it's kind of nice because it's pointing you right to, hey, these are the fuses that are involved with this system. Make sure everything's good. As far as I can tell, everything is okay there. So we're moving on past that. The next thing that it has you do is go into the keyless access control unit and run a system check. And there's actually three separate system checks, which I'll break down here, but it says to do a system check. And each one of those checks will present you with a code and you'll get a code no matter what, once you run this system check, and this is within the scan tool, you'll get a code. And there is a code that I think N1 is normal, means there's no issue with the immobilizer system. And then there's a series of two digit codes that are going to point to a different fault within the immobilizer system. So this is getting my, me my trouble codes, hopefully, that I don't have through the actual initial scan of the scan tool, right? And we see this with certain systems where just a generic scan doesn't get you any sort of trouble code and, and designed that way. It doesn't set a trouble code that you can easily pull. You have to go into the specific spot within the vehicle and you know get that module to give you something specific to run a self-check on itself. And there's a few different examples of that, like um, a GM with some older hybrid stuff. I recall you have to go in and get it to run a specific check on itself to spit back out a code or go into a specific area of the tool to get a specific code. Well, that's the case here with this immobilizer system is to go into the keyless access control unit and run these three system checks and see what codes you get. And that's it. And they actually have a chart and service information that's going to tell you exactly what possible problems are present depending on the code that you get from each system check. Okay. Now, I did mention that there's three of these, okay? So two of these are related directly to the keyless access control unit. There's a system check one, a system check two, and then there's a backup control unit, which I am not 100% sure, but everything I could find, the backup control unit is the button on the dash. Again, it has a little, it shows it on the diagram. It has a little, uh, you know, integrated chip uh, inside of it and it communicates with the keyless access control module it has physical switches too but it actually has some communication lines between it and the uh, um, the keyless access control unit and it is also the backup um, uh, transceiver for if your battery and your key is dead or there's an issue communicating with the key over the uh, the low frequency antennas, you hold the key up to the start button and that's your backup. There's no slot on this one. It's just hold it up to the ignition. Okay. So anyways, the, one of the system checks, as far as I could tell, is running it on that button. It says backup control unit system check. Either way, it doesn't matter that much. You're literally just hitting the buttons in the scan tool, running these system checks, and it's spitting out a code for you. Now the um, scan tool will actually give you a definition of what these codes mean. They're all two, two digit codes, but then there's also a chart and service information as well. So for the first system check, I get code C2. For the second system check, I get D2. And for the backup control unit system check, I get D2. All right, so C2, D2, and D2. So what do those mean? Um, and again, they do give you a little readout in the scan tool of what they mean. Um, and each code, in the chart and service inform information has a couple different possibilities. But what I did was I cross-referenced the three codes to see what is similar across all three of these codes. Cause I don't know, you know, which direction am I going? Cause I'm checking three parts of the system. And it, between the system check one and two for the keyless access control unit, it doesn't outline what it's checking you know, differently, but there's got to be something different about the system that it's looking at with each one of these. Anyways, the one thing that all three of these error codes shared was a communication error between the keyless access control unit and the MICU or BCM. Okay. That was on all three of those trouble codes. And the scan tool showed me the same thing. Um, the only difference is, and this is again, where it's a little confusing, the scan tool lists the MICU as the EMOS unit, which is the mobilizer system unit for Honda Acura, okay? And again, I found it, it, different places within the tool, 
the MICU is going to be listed as the EMOS unit. Okay. Now, the Kilos Access Control Unit, in my mind, is the immobilizer module, but whatever. The, the fact of the matter is that MICU is involved with the immobilizer. It's part of it, and the system will not function without that online communicating with the other two modules. And apparently, based on my trouble codes, that's what I'm dealing with, is a communication issue between our Keyless Access Control Unit and our MICU. So how do I proceed with that? It doesn't give you a ton of information in the testing of service information, but this gets me, the technician, a lot closer and, and an idea of what to test. I, I'm at least like pointing it in a direction now with these trouble codes that I got to look at how do these two modules communicate and then how do I test to see what's missing between them, okay? Um, and what I've read so far that's outlined in the description operation is that those three modules, the keyless access control unit, the powertrain control module and the MICU all communicate on this red wire and it's called the SNET. And I need to look at this particularly because there's no other communication codes present in the vehicle, right? There's these three modules, uh, like I'm not talking to them through the SNET on the scan tool. They have different networks and different networks between them too. There's a BCAN, I think, that the MICU and Keyless Access Control Unit and PCM can talk on. Um, there's a couple different uh, networks within this vehicle, but the SNET appears to be the one where the immobilizer data is transferred. And that appears to be where there's some sort of lack of communication between the keyless access and the MICU. So let's go scope this wire. That's what I want to do. What's present? Let's see what's happening on this wire. So I go to our keyless access control unit, which again is behind the left side of the dash. If you pull the panel back, the connector is pretty easy to get to. It's a red wire. I back probed it there. I have my U-scope out and I want to see what I find. Now, what I did find was you have to cycle the key because this system, when you go to key up the vehicle, communication is initiated on this SNET for a brief period of time. And then it will stop once either the vehicle is running and operational or it determines a fault. So you have to cycle the key and watch this circuit to see what happens here. Now, the voltage does come up. It's at a low, like three and a half volt bias with the key off. And I, I guess I didn't wait long enough to see if that eventually goes to zero. But once you key it up, it comes up to about nine or 10 volts. And then it pulls down for the communication, for the data packets, right? So you have a high voltage and the, between the three modules that are on this small network, they are going to pull it down to ground to transfer data packets of information between the, the three modules, which I imagine in there is the immobilizer code, right? They all have to match the three of them say, hey, is this, the, you know, and it might even be a mathematical calculation between the three of them. I don't know exactly how this one works, but there's information shared between these three modules and they all have to agree in order for that fuel release password to be given to the PCM in order for the vehicle to actually operate. So anyways, what do I see on this? I do see a voltage that comes up. I do see some pull downs. But what I also see in this, and it took me a little bit of zooming in and looking at the details, was I have voltage pulses that pull all the way to ground or very close to ground. But then I also have in between them, like half pulses. And what I mean by that is the voltage comes down off of the 9 or 10 volts that it peaks at, but it only comes down about a couple volts, maybe maybe three volts. It doesn't come down all the way to ground, but I do have some that also come all the way to ground. I'll put this picture in the um, comments on the Facebook group, but if you're watching the YouTube video, you can see this. I have a capture of my U-scope where it only goes down about a quarter of the way, I would say, uh, in reference to the other ones. Now, is that normal on this? I'm not super familiar with SNET stuff for Honda. I can't say that I recall exactly what it looks like if I've scoped it in the past, but the one nice thing about doing this repetitively on a lot of vehicles is you do tend to pick out something that just doesn't look right. 
And of course we have a perceived issue with this system based on everything that I've, you know, found so far, right? Like if everything was working and I see that, maybe I'm not so concerned, but we have a problem. We have a communication issue between these two modules on this network, I presume. And I see something that doesn't make sense or doesn't look right. Usually on a single wire communication, if there's a voltage pull down for data transfer, all of them should be very close to the same. If, if there's a small difference in voltage, and you can actually see that with the ones that go fully to ground, there is a small difference. But this is like a quarter of the amount that it's pulling it down. It's like the module can't pull the voltage all the way to ground. Now, is this my issue? I don't know for sure, but it sure seems like it's not normal. And again, I think I have a problem on this circuit or, or between these. So the next thing I want to do right now where I'm testing was the keyless access control unit. And because my, um, my trouble codes for the system checks indicate that, hey, there's an issue between the keyless access and the MICU, I'm going to go to the MICU, which this wasn't super easy. You have to pull the fuse box down. The connector with the SNET wire is on the like upper back side of this module to get to it, but I did, I pulled it down, I back probed it at the MICU and I see the exact same pattern, All right? So I'm wondering, hey, is there a break in this wire? And there was a, a splice where this um, connection comes together um, before it goes to the three modules and maybe there's a corrosion or resistance there, I don't know yet, but what I'm gonna do is test at the MICU and see, do I have a different pattern? Does it look any different? And it doesn't, it looks exactly the same. So what do I do here now? I can go to that splice if I want to. I could start doing some resistance checks, I guess. I, but I'm lazy. And so what I wanted to do here as kind of an experiment was I want to remove one module at a time because now I know where they all are, right? I'm at the MICU. I've already tested at the keyless access control unit. And I the PCM is super easy to find. It's under the right front of the hood. And so I want to remove one of these at a time while watching my pattern and see if it changes. Meaning that that little quarter pulse that's there, does that go away if I remove a module from this? And maybe I can identify, and I, I'm kind of thinking, hey, I might see this, the MICU or the keyless access maybe be the issue, maybe. Um, but let's take one off the network at a time and just see what happens. Maybe this test will get me somewhere, maybe it won't, but it's easy in comparison to ohm checking wires or load testing wires. Uh, and maybe I'll have to get to that point, but I'm just going to try this and see what happens. So first thing I did was unplug the PCM. The pattern doesn't change at all, or at least it doesn't change those quarter pulses. It, it may have reduced the volume of traffic on the network a little bit, but my little quarter pulses are still there with just the keyless access control unit and the MICU on the network. Okay. So now I'm going to unplug my MICU in on the uh, from the SNET, just that one connector. And I do, and those little quarter pulses go away. Now, every pulse on that network, which are at this point just between the keyless access control unit and the PCM, I plug the PCM back in, they all go very close to ground when there's a data transfer. And I got to cycle the key every time to get to see this, but they all go down all the way to ground. My quarter pulses are gone. So I can pretty safely say that whatever's going on there, if it's a problem, which it seems to be, is from that MICU, that it is not able to, it's trying, it's like it's attempting to communicate and send out a data packet, but it's not able to. And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit at this point, but that the keyless access control unit, which is flagging code saying, hey, I can't talk to the MICU. That was the trouble codes that I got. It is not able to register those quarter pulses as actual data information, right? You got to think of how the computer is looking at the, the circuit on that SNET. It's looking for a change in voltage. And if that voltage doesn't cross a certain threshold, it doesn't recognize it as a, if we go to binary, you know, zeros and ones, right? And I don't know, I'm, I don't know the protocol in this SNET. I'm sure you could look it up, but one, one direction of voltage, either high or low is going to be one and the other one's going to be zero. 
And if it doesn't see enough of a change in voltage, whatever that threshold is, I don't know, maybe it's halfway, maybe it's all the way down to ground. I, I don't know what the change in voltage would have to signify in order for this to recognize a binary one or a zero, but it's not there. Okay. And those quarter pulses that don't seem to be quite be there seem to be coming from my MICU. So now I have to go towards my MICU and do a few more tests to see what's going on. And again, there's a comparison of these pictures on the, um, the uh, YouTube video if you're watching that. Otherwise, I'll put them in the comments on the Facebook group if you want to visualize this a little better so it makes sense in your head. I have the before and after of the MICU being plugged into the SNET and it being unplugged. And you can see the difference in pulses. So uh, one thing I did here quick was I plugged everything back in and I overlaid a wire because I'm already back probed at the MICU. So I overlaid a wire from that to the keyless access control unit and scoped it again. Um, same pattern, same quarter pulses. So I'm not really concerned about the circuit at this point, right? Because if it was something that was enough to pull everything down, you would see that on all of the modules, at least you would think. But it could be maybe it's just on the leg for to the MICU, but I overlaid the wire and that kind of takes care of it as far as I can tell. Um, that it, it still has those quarter pulses when I've got a direct shot between the two, eliminating the wiring on the car. Okay, so I can say that SNET, the physical wiring for the SNET is most likely okay. I don't see an issue here. So then the next thing I need to do is powers and grounds at the MICU because um, one of the things I'm thinking is, well, there could be a connector issue and I checked the pin fitment for that wire at the SNET, but also the powers and grounds, specifically the grounds, right? Because let's say the module didn't have a proper ground and it has multiple grounds. So maybe it's just one, right? right? Everything functioned on the module right? The door locks work, you know, this thing runs a lot of things on the car, all of that functions. So it's not like it doesn't have any ground, but maybe there's an individual ground that is just for this particular portion of its function. And if it doesn't have a ground, it's not going to be pulled the signal down to ground, right? So anyways, I load tested the powers and grounds and they're all fine. Pin fitment checks. Okay. I don't see anything else that could be causing this besides the fact that the M MICU could be failed. Okay, that's that's where I'm at with this one right here. I, I was thinking, I was like, I didn't have a whole lot else to test. So I called the MICU here. And uh, by the way, if you're watching the YouTube, I do apologize. <laughs> I'm looking at the uh, acronym that I wrote and about every other time it's different between MCIU and MICU. So uh, apologies for that, but it is MICU. Anyways, I called it. I said, hey, this is what I found. I suspect there's something wrong with this module. I don't see any electrical issues that could be causing it outside of the module. Get one and we'll program it in because it does need to be programmed to the vehicle or registered to the vehicle. Customer asked, hey, can I do a used one? I'm like, I don't know. I never tried one. Um, but I said, I'll try if you get a used one. He did. Uh, found out you can register it with the Autel IM608 very easily. Uh, it was a simple registration. And I will say this. It was in a theft mode, exactly like uh, the way that it was. Exactly like the way that it was before I registered it. Um, and I was thinking, I was like, well, maybe I just needed to register that control unit because I never tried that. But I did scope this wire and those quarter pulses were gone once he installed a used MICU. So I don't think registering it would have worked, especially being as it's system checks so there's no com between the two. You can't register it because you actually register it through the keyless access control unit. And if it can't talk to the MICU, you're not going to be able to register it. So I, that wouldn't have fixed anything as far as I'm concerned. But anyways, with a, with the used one, I was able to do that. If I write it up, it ran. No more of those little quarter pulses on the SNET. We're good to go. As far as I can tell, we fixed that vehicle. Uh, it is all set. So that's what I got for you on that one. Uh, that one did take me a little while to get through. Uh, you know, I summarized it rather quickly here for the podcast, but uh, it was a little bit of a struggle in the moment. But I did learn just a ton about that immobilizer system. 
uh, that I really didn't know going in. So hopefully the next time I see one of these Honda Acura push start systems, I'll be much more prepared to tackle it. And hopefully you will as well. Hopefully this is helpful to you and you gain something from this. Uh, if you got some more information on these systems and you're a Honda Acura um, technician, uh, you know, leave a comment. Let me know uh, what I'm you know, missing or information that would be helpful on something like this for me and the other listeners. Uh, I always appreciate everyone's feedback because everyone's got you know, knowledge in a certain area that will exceed my own, right? Experience in a particular brand or system that, you know, I've never dealt with before. So I always like to get the feedback from everyone else. So go ahead and leave that stuff. Um, also like to just thank everybody out there for listening to the podcast and all the feedback uh, that I get on it. Always appreciate that stuff. But um, I want to wish everybody a happy new year. Uh, it's 2024. Uh, let's uh, get out there and make it an awesome year. Crush it. But with that all the way, let's get out there. Start fixing the world one car at a time.